Hello and welcome to this episode of Coffee and Politics on our digital TV channel F15. Today I will be talking to multi-generational New Yorker and former Marine Zach Iskell who is running in the New York City municipal elections that will take place in November 2021. Here to talk about his candidacy and his vision for the city. Welcome to the show, Zach. So glad you could take the time and uh, you, you're the first guest to take the coffee seriously and to I, I don't mess around. Not my my the city mug. There you go. I got a skyline yeah. happening. What what kind of coffee are you drinking in there? Black. All right. Just going simple. Just going so. Simple. Yeah. Welcome to Coffee and Politics. Um, so you originally uh, started your campaign running for mayor of New York City. Yeah. There are now over thirty candidates, of, as I've heard, and you recently um, yesterday announced that you are running for comptroller instead. Um, could you perhaps explain to us what that position is? Because I know a lot of people don't quite know what it is and yeah. why you're running for it. Yeah, so uh, number one is, is I threw my hat into the mayor's race because I'm concerned about the state of the city. I love New York uh, and I've always gone where I felt that I was needed. Uh, so I volunteered, I, my, my background, I was in the Marine Corps, I was in the infantry and special operations, I led troops through some of the heaviest combat of the Iraq war. I volunteered for my second deployment to Iraq because I felt that's where I was needed. When I came home from that, uh, from that war, I suffered from post-traumatic stress, from traumatic levels of, of survivor skill. I was able to get the help I needed. A lot of my fellow veterans were not. Um, and I struggled to get them into the VA and to the mm -hmm. care they needed. Department of Veterans Affairs, we couldn't navigate that bureaucracy. So once again, I sort of went where I was needed and I started a nonprofit called the Headstrong Project. That's now one of the largest and leading providers of mental health care in the US. We were taking care of 802,000 veterans every single week. And then, uh, you know, I also had a translator from Iraq who became in, in hunted by insurgents. Uh, you know, I ended up putting my uniform on, going up to Capitol Hill, testifying before the United States Senate to provide him a path to come to the United States. It led to a path to help almost 100,000 other Iraqis and Afghans come here. The height of COVID, I went to Javits Medical Center as a volunteer. I ended up becoming the deputy director of Javits Medical Center. It's really a story that hasn't been told, but I helped lead the turnaround of Javits Medical Center from empty beds to getting 28 federal, state, and city agencies to work together uh, to treat New Yorkers during one of their greatest times of need. And again, you know, when I, when you sort of look at the state of the city, um, the issues that are facing the city, they're profound. We've lost 500, 600,000 jobs, people who have lost their jobs. A third of our small businesses, half of our restaurants are in danger of closing. You know, these issues are profound. We have more homelessness on our streets than at any point in time. We have rising rates of crime. We have a need for police reform. And, you know, I have a particular set of experiences. Uh, I've worked in the biz, I've built businesses. I built a nonprofit. I've worked in government. And I think for us to recover from COVID and for us to get every New Yorker back on their feet, it's going to require somebody with a breadth of experience who's gonna be able to bring every resource in this town together to solve those problems. And you know, one of the things that's happened over the course of this campaign, some folks approached me in late December, early January about shifting to the comptroller's race. And you know, I started spending time with a lot of the other male candidates and it's, it's people make fun of how big the field is. It's like mm -hmm. 34 people, but it's also a remarkable group of people. And I've gotten to uh, really appreciate uh, the diversity. There's some people who will be history making candidates, uh, women, people of color, women of color, but also a diversity of experiences, backgrounds, uh, uh, ideologies, capabilities. And I didn't see that happening in the comptroller's race either. I saw that there was a big need. And I think for us to really bring this city back, we're gonna need a great mayor. We're gonna need, there's 37 open city council seats. We're gonna need great city council members. And we are also going to need a remarkable comptroller. Uh, in terms of your question about what the comptroller mm -hmm. does, mm -hmm. comptroller is the city's watchdog. Uh, they are responsible for oversight of all the city agencies. Uh, they manage the city's $250 billion pension fund. And their job is really to make sure the city is working and doing its job for all New Yorkers. And I think that there's a, you know, I think we can look back on the last eight years or seven years, and we can really see that there's a lot of areas that the city has fallen short, you know, with this pandemic and beyond. And there is really a need for somebody who is going to be out there on the front lines, making sure the city does its job 
uh, for the people of the city. Mm -hmm. um, so how does that uh, position of the comptroller work together with the mayor? Is there a lot of cooperation? Um, do they work sort of side by side? How do you envision this? Yeah, it depends on the mayor. You know, that, that, that's bottom line, it depends on the mayor. And I'm gonna apologize right now. We have three rescue dogs who in a minute might start barking uncontrollably because uh, my wife is, is waiting for a package. Hopefully they will behave themselves. I told the dogs that I'm doing an interview right now. Hopefully they will uh, They listen. know what's up. <laughs> sometimes they do, sometimes they, they wanna have their voices heard too. Uh, you know, it really, the, the, the comptroller and the mayor, the comptroller is an independent office. It is one of three citywide elected officials, the mayor, the public advocate, and the comptroller. Comptroller has a team of 800 accountants, lawyers, and engineers whose job it is is to look under the hood of city agencies and make sure that they are delivering, you know, what they're supposed to be doing. There is a, a great lot of opportunities there for the mayor and the comptroller to work together, uh, but the comptroller is also, you know, supposed to be a check on the mayor. It's supposed to hold the mayor accountable in many ways, uh, is to make sure that there's no waste, no fraud, no corruption. And, you know, as comptroller, I would take that responsibility very, very seriously. Mm -hmm. So you uh, mentioned how you've stepped in in times of crises from after 9-11, you enlisted, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Yeah, I actually, so I, I was commissioned August 11th, 2001, exactly one month before 9-11, I was commissioned an officer in the Marine Corps. Uh, but I did serve, you know, after 9-11 um, and, uh, and continued my service after 9-11. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you for your service very much. You. And um, when Hurricane Sandy hit the city, you were there, and you mentioned uh, with the coronavirus pandemic, you were at Javits Center. Um, I actually met my wife in the wake of Hurricane Sandy. I was helping lead some of the rescue efforts out there, and uh, the time of my wife. Wow. So, I mean, there, the city has been hit by a couple of crises. Um, this would not be new to you. Um, what experiences would you like to take from having um, dealt with crisis before to your new position as comptroller if you are elected? Yes, yeah, so number one is I think that, you know, the only way that you can get through a crisis is together. That's one thing I've learned. And, and whether it's bringing together Iraqi tribes, Shia and Sunni soldiers, U.S. Marines, whether it's building public-private partnerships to deliver world-class health care to veterans, whether it's working at Javits Medical Center and getting 28 federal, state, and city agencies, uh, hospital systems to work in conjunction to build a COVID hospital in five days, it is really about collaboration. And, you know, for example, if you look at something, I'll give you an example. The city spends something like $650 million on workforce education and training. Mm -hmm. The private sector has almost nothing to do with that. How do you do workforce training and development without including the private sector? the place where people are supposed to be going to get jobs. And so one of the things I would really be doing as comptroller is looking at the, at the effectiveness of the dollars that are being spent. As, as when I ran Headstrong, a leading nonprofit that, that provides mental health, our AFR, the percentage of our dollars that go to actually direct care was 85, 87%. That means 85, 80 cents on the dollar were going to actually care for veterans. We had very low overhead. I mean, you look at some of the problems, like you look at homelessness. Homelessness is a huge problem in this city. Uh, we spend $3 billion a year on homelessness. It's more than almost every major city in the U.S. spends on homelessness combined. But that money isn't being spent to end homelessness or to treat homelessness. It's actually in many ways being spent to keep people in homelessness because it's being spent on a shelter system as opposed to programs that could keep people out of the shelter system or get them out of the shelter system. And so one of the things I would be laser focused on is, is what's the outcome we're looking for? If our mission is to end homelessness, are we spending those $3 billion as effectively as possible to make sure that, you know, the families that are suffering from homelessness are able to get into housing, that kids are not food or housing or technology insecure, that we're sort of doing all the things we need to be doing to solve that problem. And that's a big part of leading through crisis. What's the, what's the problem that's causing that crisis and how do you direct resources to solve it? Uh, the, the, uh, the other thing I will add to that is I think one of the things uh, that I would also be focused on is really using the office to also look forward. You know, when you look at, if, if we go back to March of, of this year, there was a lot of things that have been predictable that the city was completely unprepared for. So we were caught on our back foot with the pandemic. But 
we were also caught on our back foot with school openings. That was predictable that we had to open schools. Mm -hmm. It was predictable now that we had to distribute a vaccine, right? There is a role that the contractor that the comptroller can play to say, you know, what are some of the problems we're going to face in the next six, 12 months, in the next few years? We know climate change is a huge issue that could affect the city. What are our plans to address this? How resilient is the city to flooding or to storms? So I want also to make sure that we use this to also this position to also sort of audit and understand how prepared the city is for the next pandemic, for climate change things, for things like distributing the vaccine or whatever those issues are coming down the line. Mm. When I hear you talk about how you would like to tackle things, for instance, if our mission is to end homelessness, I feel like you're bringing a bit of a military mindset to trying to tackle civilian problems instead of sort of a political mindset, sort of a how do we get this done effectively kind of. Yeah, like that. I think you're absolutely right. Look, when you're when you're in the military, there's no room for politics. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're in life and death situations, when you are, you know, when when you know in Fallujah, if you have a problem in front of you, you don't care what the politics of the per, of the, the marine on your left and your right are. You don't care what their background is. You don't. I mean, none of that matters. What matters is you have a problem in front of you that you got that you all need to solve together. And that's one of the things that's so remarkable about running for office in New York is you realize that the problems facing this city, there's nobody that doesn't agree these problems need to be solved, right? Like there, there's nobody that's like, yeah, really want to see more homeless people on the street or really would like to see fewer jobs or, you know, housing is just not unaffordable enough. Like we all agree these problems need to be solved. We just need to sort of start to work together on solving these problems. And in the military, you learn how to bring people together around that. And you realize that's the only way you can effectively mm -hmm. Uh, achieve some of these outcomes. Mm. And so you also mentioned on your website that you would like to see a generational change, that maybe the city is stuck in the, the 1950s, um, it says. What would be your vision for a gener generational change? How would you, even if um, these uh, policies wouldn't quite be um, doable for you as comptroller, what would your vision be for the city going forward in the next 10 years? Yeah, so there's a lot. Uh, but at the, the, the starting point is, is that, you know, as, as you see, like many of the problems the city is facing are deeply interconnected, you know, so you name the problem, whether we're talking about increases in crime and, and, and the need to address public safety or police reform, if we're talking about the education gap, right, we have a, we have a hundred thousand kids in our school system who are housing, food, and, and technology insecure. How are we supposed to, like, this is not just about smaller class sizes. This is not just about better schools. This is also about what we're doing to make sure those kids have a fighting chance. And we know these problems are interconnected, but the way we address them is not. We have a city government that is very siloed. We have agencies that do not work together at the local level for trying to solve these problems. They certainly don't work well with nonprofits or with even the private sector. And I think that's something that I would really want to bring to city government is a focus on how do we create task forces that are focused on these problems that involve multiple city agencies, uh, that include the state and the federal government, that include community partners, nonprofits, and also the private sector. Because if you can marshal all of those resources, especially in a time of fiscal constraint, especially because we are going into a time where we're gonna have, we're gonna have to learn to do more with less, the only way we can solve these problems is by working together. And I think that is a 21st century model of government. There's ways that technology can empower you to, to do that better and, and foster that collaboration. That's a 21st century model of government that we need to really invest in here in New York City. Mm -hmm. And have you felt like um, in the past uh, years of the de Blasio administration, how has that been for you? What do you think of the current mayor? <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, silence can be telling too. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it's, um, it's deeply disappointing. You know, I, I mean, it's, it, it would be one thing. It's, it's just, it's been disappointment after disappointment and, and missed opportunity after missed opportunity. And, and, you know, I think that we need a mayor who is, yeah, we need we need elected officials who care. We're going to show up. We're going to put in the hours. Uh, who care more about the real outcomes and the outcomes that affect people's lives than just steering towards a political outcome of winning an election. And I think that's a lesson for all New Yorkers. 
Like we, we can't just go back to more of the same with politicians uh, who shirk their responsibilities, don't show up and don't do the work. Mm. I mean, it's obviously a tough election year. It's the coronavirus uh, pandemic has hit, especially New York City. Um, how are you running your campaign uh, during a pandemic? Is uh, it more digital? Um, how do you replace the sort of grass? It's a lot of digital. Yeah, you know, some of it's actually been, it has been great. So uh, you, you can do a lot of grassroots stuff digitally, right? We do a ton of, of meet and greets, town halls. Uh, we'll, we'll sometimes do two, three meet and greets a night where we're talking to, you know, groups of 12, 14 plus people. We've done a number of online fundraisers digitally. We're also doing some things out and about in the community, meeting with community partners in a socially distanced and safe manner. It's also interesting though, because I, you know, I'm a dad, I have four kids and they're now much more aware of the campaign, right? Mm -hmm. There are moments where I, there's actually one moment where it's happened a couple of times where I've been doing a fundraiser or I'll do an interview over zoom and I will be playing connect four on the other side of the screen with my six year old. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and so, and it's interesting because the kids pick up on stuff and then they start to ask you questions about different issues that you're discussing and it's good debate prep it's also really good debate yeah. prep yes when, when your kids are asking you why something is the way it is mm -hmm. you know it, it definitely uh they, they many cases ask the best questions yeah um and you've mentioned mental health a couple times and specifically your ptsd coming back from uh, serving um this is also seems to be a an issue that is close to your heart is there anything you would any policies you would like to see um pursued as, if you're elected there's no shortage of policies. Uh, I think that, you know, mental health is, is one of the things that I care the most about. Uh, you know, I was in one of the hardest battalions of the Iraq war, hardest hit battalions of the Iraq war. We've now lost more Marines to suicide than we did in combat. And wow. it was one of the impotences. It, it was one of the reasons that we started the Headstrong project. And, you know, and so, and it's interesting, like one of the things that I hear the most from New Yorkers is that they can't sleep at night. I hear mm -hmm. from people all over the city. I hear it from kids growing up in communities uh, that have been most affected by gun violence. I hear it from people who have built, who have run multi-generational businesses that are on the verge of losing it all. I hear it from people who have lost their jobs from parents, right? Parents who are now trying to Zoom school their kids while also, you know, make ends meet. There is a tremendous amount of stress in, in this town right now. Uh, we're suffering from lots of grief. You know, we've lost 26,000 of our fellow New Yorkers. And, you know, for families um, uh, who have lost loved ones, you know, I mean, it's it's awful. Like, you know, when, when I was running Javits, I would sit with some of our patients and try and get them in touch with their family members and, you know, not even be able to visit somebody that you love, right? Like it is, we, we have been through, and it's actually like, this is sort of remarkable, but it's more dangerous to be a New Yorker in the time of COVID than it is to have served in combat over the last 20 years. We've lost a greater percentage of New Yorkers to COVID than we have lost a percentage of troops who have served in Iraq and Afghanistan. And so one of the things that we know that is coming is a mental health pandemic. Uh, we're seeing increases rates of domestic violence, of child abuse, of substance abuse, suicidality. This is a major, major issue that we need to address. Uh, Mayor de Blasio and his wife started a program called Thrive New York City. It's a billion dollar mental health care program. One of the problems with it is there was no outcomes, right? There was no sort of, they, they just sort of threw money at this problem without really thinking about what are we trying to solve? How are we doing this? And as somebody who has a deep background and experience in mental health and scaling mental health care programs, you know, I will bring a wealth of knowledge and ideas and ways that we can increase the capacity for care by creating channels to, uh, you know, make, uh, you know, train and educate more psychologists, psychiatrists, licensed clinical social workers, especially in poor communities, communities of color that are usually underrepresented in those fields, uh, but also doing things to prevent the need for those services, right? Reducing sort of the mm -hmm. demand for those services. Preventative, yeah. Preventative things, mm -hmm. you know, and that's everything from peer support groups, parks, green spaces, access to the outdoors, uh, different type, you know, making sure people have a healthy diet and exercise. Like these are all drivers of mental health mm -hmm. uh, that we can include in a comprehensive plan to address this next pandemic. Yeah, I think also community building is really important in this um, because a lot of mental health stems from maybe a sense of 
feeling alienated or very yeah. lonely. And this can be tough in a big city like New York where there are tons of people. It's very densely populated at the same time. Yeah. You might feel very lonely. Um, and this is yeah. very tough. But to end on a more positive note, um, last yeah. question, but least, uh, but not least important, do you have a favorite bagel shop? Asking for a friend. Oh, God. Um, you know, it's funny. Um, I, you know, I mean, sort of, uh, you know, my, I actually had this uh, a question during a forum recently. It was like, what's your, what's your favorite, uh, um, or what, what was it? There was, I can't remember what it exactly was or what it came up with, but uh, it was like something about like your New York moment. Mm -hmm. And one of it was that uh, my mom um, uh, tried to vacuum seal some slices of New York City pizza to send to me when I was deployed. Uh, the pizza didn't make it, but they also would send me H&H &H bagels. Um, and, you know, so like I have, you know, H&H &H bagels were sort of, you know, I ate them throughout my deployments. Okay, good to know. Yeah. Good to know. Well, I wish you all the very best. The primary is in June, if I'm not mistaken. June 22nd. Uh, make sure to register to vote. Um, you know, you can also, if you are, you know, in New York City, the Democratic primary is really the, the most important election. If you are not registered as a Democrat, you have until February 15th to do that. I encourage everybody to register to vote by February 15th so that you can participate in that primary. There and we go. We have two more weeks, right? Um, yes, we have get the word out. Two more weeks. Yeah. yeah. I wish you all the best. And thank, thank you. you so much for taking the time. Yeah, thanks so much. It's great to, great to talk to you and I appreciate it. Thank you.